we were talking prior to sitting now, yes. you mentioned an article that came out just a couple of weeks ago in The Lancet, and I think it's very important to share this information with women regarding the CA-125. Uh, uh, it's a tumor marker that looks, I believe, for a protein in the blood. Uh, I'd love for you, I remember a couple of years ago at ASCO uh, there was a discussion and this Lancet article seems to uh, raise that information to a new level. Yeah, the Lancet article that's just been published is by uh, Rustin uh, and colleagues from a trial that was coordinated by the Medical Research Council Cancer Trials Unit in the UK and the EORTC, the European Organization for Research and Treatment on Cancer. And it was designed to evaluate whether treating patients who develop recurrent ovarian cancer early was beneficial or not. And the thing about ovarian cancer is that it is associated with this marker called CA125. Um, and CA125 often starts to rise, which is an indicator that the disease is beginning to activate, but it often starts to rise before and sometimes up to about six months before there's any evidence on scans or symptoms of recurrent ovarian cancer. So a question that's been taxing uh, oncologists for many years is the patients where the CA125 is rising, is it better to get on and start the next course of chemotherapy at that point or is it better to wait until they have started to develop symptoms of the disease? So this study was designed to try and answer that question. And the way in which it was, it was done is that patients were seen in the clinic every three months or so in the usual way. Blood was taken and it was measured for CA125, but the results of the CA125 analysis went back to the study centre. It didn't come back to the doctors. And the point at which the CA125 started to rise, patients were randomised within the study for either the result to remain confidential to the study centre or for the patient's doctor and patient to be informed of the result. So in half of the, pa half of the cases where the CA125 was rising, the doctor and patient knew the result and in the other half of the patients they didn't know the result. So what happened was when the doctor and the patient were informed that the CA125 was rising, usually that patient was started back on further chemotherapy at, at that point. Whereas in the other group where the patients remained well, with no symptoms or signs of ovarian cancer, living a normal life, they were not started on treatment until, until such time as they developed signs or symptoms that indicated that the disease was reactivating. And that was often some months later. So I think about six months or so later was the, was the difference in the timing of the start of further chemotherapy treatment. So the important point was, did that earlier introduction of chemotherapy, or maybe to look at it the other way around, delayed introduction of chemotherapy, did that, did that affect the overall survival? And the answer to the question is it didn't. It didn't make one jot of difference to the overall survival. So when we draw out the survival curves, the patients lived just as long if they didn't receive chemotherapy immediately as they did if they received chemotherapy immediately. But the other important factor was, if you look at how much chemotherapy patients received over the course of their life after diagnosis of ovarian cancer and before they died from ovarian cancer, it was substantially less in the group of patients where the CA125 had not been notified. So you might argue that patients had been spared receiving a lot of chemotherapy, which might not have done them any any good. So they were spared the toxicities of that treatment, the inconveniences of that treatment, the effects of that treatment on their quality of life. So that raises a, re a very real question about whether we as doctors should be subjecting our patients to regular monitoring of CA125. And for many patients that's like a drug. They come to the clinic, they get their CA125, they sit in the waiting room sweating, tremulous, waiting for that result to come back, when it's normal, they have an overwhelming sense of relief and they go off and live their life normally, again, until the next appointment two or three months later when the cycle repeats. And you could argue that, is that actually giving the patients any real service by putting them through that additional anxiety, if in the end it doesn't make any difference to the outcome? 
So that's the key finding from that study. Yes, and you know, there, are, there is the true flip side of that whole psychosocial dilemma of this because patients, and I'm one of them, you tend to feel a sense of empowerment and greater control when you're proactive and, you know, of knowledge is power and, 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 and you're, you're screening and you get a result and it's a negative result, yes, you feel a profound sense of relief. Yes. Is it a false sense of relief? I don't know. But it's a very interesting psychosocial dilemma hmm. that the science presents. No, I, I, and I completely agree with that. And at the end of the day, just because the patient has ovarian cancer does not mean that they're the same as all the other patients exactly. with ovarian cancer, does it? They've got their own very individual needs, their own very individual approach to risks. And actually probably what will happen is that doctors will have a discussion with their patients and reach an agreement with their patients about what the follow-up should be. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it may need to be very intensive with lots of monitoring. Yes. Because they require that for their, for their own self-satisfaction or their own their own uh, reassurance and for others it'll be the opposite of that and you know, maybe some, some people. It, it's a it's a stretch a little bit of personalized medicine but in, oh, in some in some way it's exactly that well I'm going to be most interested in sort of following where now we'll wait till you know 2012 but we'll see where the data goes must what's most important is that there's a spotlight on ovarian cancer there's hope for the community of women all over the world facing this very difficult disease. And I really want to thank you for doing the work that you're doing and for taking time out to talk to us. Okay, so it's a pleasure to, to have done that. But I think it, just a couple of closing points, if, it, if it's all right. Um, and that is to say that the data we're presenting today and the data that was presented by the GOG in, at ASCO in June is the first advance in terms of a new drug in ovarian cancer that we've seen for since the early 1990s. So this is a very real step forward. It's, it gives you chills when you think about the, how long it's taken yes. to begin to see a new treatment advance for this really difficult disease that isn't the same in all women. It isn't, that's right. But we will have to await the more mature results, but I think there's no doubt that the data that, we've, that we're presenting is, go is going to influence the discussions the doctors have with their patients and vice versa. But more importantly, it's going to influence the design of the next generation of clinical yes. trials. Because we now know that this drug has an effect, but we don't yet know how best to use it. And it also points to the, the fact that we're using combination therapies, chemotherapy, um, new, more biologic uh, uh, treatments, and it is combination therapy that keeps getting the theme of, of combining these modalities, which really is personalized medicine. It is personalized medicine, that's right. And what we need to be able to do is to identify the people, the women, the patients, who are really going to benefit from this intervention and treat them in the best way we can. And at the same time, identify those people that are not going to benefit from right. this and develop some sort of intervention that's going to be more beneficial for them and spare them having to have this sort of treatment. Well, and the information that you shared with us today will go towards facilitating the discussions that patients need to have with their doctors. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Tim Perren, you come to us from Leeds, UK, at St. James University Hospital. Well, thank you for Thanks. your time. Thank you so much.